I'm Al DeFazio. I'm with the, uh, with the high school, and I've got sections of 10th grade and 9th grade this year. We, we've been asked to report on what we, doing, what we have been doing with technology in the classroom, and I, I would say three things, and they're a little abstract. The first is that we've been making time. The second is that we've been cultivating reflection. And the third is that we've been healing fragmentation. So here's what I mean when I say that we've been making time. We save steps. We save steps by having much of our content come to us uh, by meeting it on our phones, on our laptops, or on our iPads. So we actually save physical steps, but we also, say, we also create multiple avenues to our content. It can be in the cloud, uh, in a Google Drive, or in a Dropbox. It can be on a hard drive or a flash drive. Um, it can be in our learning management system. And if all else fails, it can be in hard copy in our backpacks. It also saves us technology, it saves us keystrokes. Uh, when the information comes to us or is created by us digitally, we can cut and paste it rather than rekey. And I know that there are some people out there old enough to remember typing up a paper in college and getting down to that footnote on the bottom of the paper and discovering there wasn't enough room and having to type the whole thing over again. Our students wouldn't have any patience for that today. So while we're not really making more time, we are using technology to expedite perfunctory tasks freeing up real time for meaningful learning. This means that we can spend less time distributing and collecting content and measurements and more time considering the significance of what we're doing. The second thing we do is cultivate reflection. We often ask for the considered reflection of our students. And ideally, when we ask them to reflect, we ask them to consider something in the context of their experience, of their entire experience. But practically, when we ask them uh, what they think, we're often confining uh, their scope of response to a chapter or a unit or a quarter or maybe even a semester. Last year's reflections are often as remote to them as last decades. Technology can make students' past reflections more accessible to them, and in doing so, it might teach them to more value the content of their current reflections. Some students abandon their work daily on their way out of the classroom into the trash can. Others clean out their binders quarterly, uh, and most students start the new school year with empty binders. Technology, and specifically the Google Drive or Dropbox, can become the binder that holds together last year and this one. Uh, or it can house the essays of all four of your students' high school years. Or it can be the repository, repository for all of their writing pre-K until they're done. At the high school level, we, we require something called a capstone essay from all of our seniors. It's an essay that asks the broad question, who are you and how did you get to be that way? This is a wonderful assignment that catches students on the verge of one of the significant transitions in their lives, leaving home, embarking on a new journey to college or the military or the workforce. Until now, when most students would begin this essay in the fall of their senior year, they would have very little to draw upon except their own memories. Now they can write that essay with access to maybe as many as a dozen years worth of reflective writings that will be at their fingertips. In providing students with opportunities to make time and to cultivate reflection, technology changes the rate at which students execute perfunctory tasks and it provides a repository for their work, but it doesn't unseat our curricular objectives. The third thing that technology has begun to do for us is to help us connect our fragments. Within our individual disciplines, we can now engage in more vertical integration. We can pass along electronic portfolios from year to year. We can start projects in one year and finish them in the next, and that's something we already do in IBHL. But technology democratizes that process and makes it available for everyone, K through 12. Across the disciplines, technology can change the way we think about the walls between our classrooms. Without much difficulty, our screens can become windows and portals, and Steinbeck's saga of the Jodes might be taught in conjunction with another department's unit on ecology. And maybe our students would be fascinated to see how the Salinas Valley, the stoop crop capital of the world, has become one of the world's largest industrial organic farms. Last week, I happened to walk by a high school biology teacher who was preparing beds to plant radishes. The root system of these radishes are apparently powerful enough to drill down into Virginia's clay soil 
acting as aerators to capture rainwater and reduce runoff of synthetic fertilizers. This teacher and I have students in common, and I'd love to team with him, uh, perhaps by assigning nonfiction readings that would address issues like clean water and urban agriculture. In addition to saving time and encouraging reflection and healing fragmentation, technology also allows what someone has called permissionless innovation, which means that if, a student, if students can figure out a better way to do something, there's nothing preventing it, and then they're invited to teach it to us as well. It's also preparing them for post-secondary education in important ways. Most of them will take at least one of their courses in college online. Freshman athletes at some colleges need to report by midsummer before their first year so they can take their first college courses entirely online. All learning management systems are a little different, but once students have experienced one, the learning curve on the rest of them is much more gentle. And having technology in the classroom every day makes it possible for us to teach some computer skills almost by accident. For example, when I return essays, I address the strengths and weaknesses in a mini lecture, ticking off the key points that I ask students to key into a Google spreadsheet. Once we get a couple dozen of these keyed into the sheet, um, I teach them how to sort their rows. Uh, and in the time it takes for students to take class notes, they'll be learning skills that might help them land one of the internships that they're likely to be seeking during their college years. These are just a few of the things that my students have been able to accomplish in the first seven weeks of this quarter. For more, I give you my colleague, Brian Harris. Uh, good evening. Uh, always tough to present with an English teacher, especially with that kind of vocabulary. Uh, but despite uh, seeing how different the, the two disciplines are and, and can be, a lot of the things that we do and a lot of the ways that we approach technology can be very similar, uh, particularly in the fact that they are tools that we can use to deliver curriculum and, and to get the knowledge into our students. Uh, I think one of the one of the biggest ways that's impacted me in, in my classroom specifically is my approach to collaboration. Uh, when we have kids working together in groups, and, and whether it's on labs or projects, there was a time uh, when we had maybe six computers in the room. And so you'd have six or you'd have four or five kids huddled around one computer and they'd be working on, the, on a project, whether it's a presentation, a lab, whatever it happened to be. And invariably it ended up being the most uh, outspoken, kind of driven kid would take the keyboard, end up doing most of the typing, most of the writing, most of the designing of, of the presentation or, or whatever it happened to be. And the other three would kind of huddle around, uh, pointing things out on the screen. And, and that's kind of how it went. That was group work at one point. Now we have, every kid has a, a, a laptop. And at one point, I thought that was crazy. What are you going to have? You know, you have all these kids with laptops. But what it's turned out to be, every kid has a laptop. We have Google Docs, which is amazing. Uh, they can all work on the same thing at the same time. And so it's kind of like if you've, ever, if you've ever been a gamer or you've ever gotten involved in any kind of online gaming or you see it on TV and you've got the guy in front of the computer with the, he with the headset and they're talking and they're typing and they're doing all this stuff and they're still having a conversation with all these people around the world that are doing the same thing at the same time. They're all on the same team. And while it's maybe not quite as exciting as, as leveling up and killing ogres and things like that, uh, they're working together, they're acting as a team, they're building a, a, some type of artifact as a team, and it's no longer just one student working on it, it's all of them acting together and all of them having input and all of them having a hand in the creation of uh, a presentation or a lab report or, or graphs and they can all simultaneously put things into this artifact and they can see how it looks and then they can share it. Then they can share it with me which it makes it much easier because now they don't have to worry about emailing it or uploading it or printing it off or any of that. Uh, all, the, all those areas where uh, the new my dog ate my homework uh, it, you don't have to worry about it anymore because all they have to do is share it with you and now you have access to it and you can make comments on it. Um, and so to, to see that level of interaction and engagement between students uh, in those group type setting has really been very exciting for me. Uh, the, the way that it's grown with all this new technology has been fantastic. Uh, particularly when we're, because in science we do labs and, and, and 
very rarely do we la do labs individually. And so to have that technology where we can share data now, and uh, in addition to just the, the group work presentation, we, we collect data as a, as a class and sometimes across classes. Uh, this year, I, unfortunately, I'm only teaching one section of each of the sciences, but uh, in last year when I had multiple sections of a physics course, we could do the same experiment across, uh, across classes that weren't even uh, necessarily interacting on, a, on an individual level, and we could share data. Now, instead of having three or four trials of a particular experiment, now we have 30 trials. And so now we can collect averages and we can graph that, and now our results, they can see how uh, just having three or four pieces of data, they may have 50% error. But now, as soon as we get all of these other pieces in, and now we can start looking at uh, accuracy and precision. And what happens when we start doing this over and over and over again, while we don't have time individually to run 80 trials over the course of three or four classes and all of those kids, now we have all this data to collect and we can see how much more accurate that actually becomes. And so it's kind of cool because now it brings up all these other conversations about, uh, specifically in science, why do we do multiple trials and what does it mean to be accurate and precise and, and what does that look like on a larger scale? Um, so I think we're probably running out of time. Uh, I could talk about this all night, but, uh, but I'll stop there. So thank you. <laughs>